Well, good afternoon, and uh, I'd like to just uh, welcome everyone here and also thank all of you for giving me the opportunity to be here. Uh, it seems like not only is this a great city and a great venue for a meeting, it looks like our weather is just fantastic. So everything is looking up. So what I was going to do today is talk to you a little bit about um, one specific filter, but also kind of cover really with you some of the issues that we go through in filter design and some of the problems that exist with filter usage. And um, while I plan on doing this as a lecture, I, I would tell you that I'm a pretty informal person. So I would suggest that at the end we'll have time for questions. But if something comes up in the middle, I really don't mind if you just put your hand up. Uh, just say, hey, Jim, what about this or that? And we can discuss it as we go. It might make it more interesting if that's how you want to do it. So don't hesitate at all to um, uh, just to jump in and, and ask a question. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk a little bit about background of filters. We're going to talk about how are clinical outcomes affected by filter design and technology, some IVC filter positioning issues, and then uh, definitely leave some time for questions and answers. But once again, don't hesitate to, to jump in. I wanted to just start out with a little bit of background. Now, now in Canada, um, although we share a border just across the river, things are very different in the U.S. with filters compared to Canada and actually compared to the rest of the world. In fact, we're often accused in the states of overutilization of filters. We put in tons of filters. I happen to be a strong believer that that is probably true. We probably were, in fact, the FDA right now in the states is, is put a lot of pressure on us to really look at why we're doing things. And I was going to get a little bit in, just give you a little background of what's going on, um, and then we'll get into some of these specifics. But to kind of show you this, in 1979, in the United States, 2,000 filters were placed. By 1999, 40, 000, uh, 49,000 filters were placed. But what's interesting is the indication for filter placement by our FDA is uh, pulmonary embolism, problems with pulmonary embolism, can't be anticoagulated, failure of anticoagulation. But of all the filters that were put in in 1999, only 36% had PE, only 45% uh, had DVT alone, and 20% of the patients who got a filter had neither DVT or PE, which is kind of a, uh, an interesting thing. What's happened since then? Well, that was 1999. By 2012, 240,000 filters were put in. So in our hospital uh, in Miami, we were averaging for a number of years. It's tapered off in the past two years because of some of the new regulatory things, but about 350 to 400, 400 filters a year. And they were going in uh, for a lot of different reasons. Um, up to, I told you, 36% before in 1999 were placed without, DV, without a PE. The FDA estimates right now over half of the filters going in in the United States are being placed without a DVT or a PE. So for no clot, just because someone's considered high risk for clot. Um, and what's interesting is in the States, about 25 times more filters are placed uh, for an equivalent, equivalent population than there are uh, in Europe. And um, I know in Miami alone, we placed more filters than uh, were placed in the country of Sweden for uh, an equivalent year. Uh, we had looked at some data from different countries, and we saw that we had, uh, that's where our, our city ended up. This is another graph that just shows you what happens. Patients who, um, uh, with no PE or DVT, going back from 1979 to where we are now, and you can see the sharp rise. So a big reason for this we're going to get into is that, is that we can, we put filters in that we say, well, we can take them out whenever. And we're going to get into all the benefits of that. But I just want to paint this picture for you because if you talk to people in the States now, filter use is being um, curtailed a bit. The FDA actually, the indication for a filter according to the FDA really is for the prevention of recurrent pulmonary embolism, not for prophylaxis. Um, and it's really only for pulmonary embolism. Either you um, anticoagulant may be contraindicated or if you're anticoagulated and you have progression of disease, um, 
or someone has a massive PE. Those are really the only FDA cleared indications. But the problem is throughout the U.S. is that the guidelines for placing a filter are not consistent. So the American College of Chest Physicians, whose recommendations we follow closely in all aspects of medicine when we talk about PE and DVT, um, doesn't recommend prophylaxis in bariatric patients, trauma patients, pregnant patients, cancer patients. But meanwhile, many other groups do. So there's all these different issues that are going on in different groups. Um, uh, and so there's no real, cl real clear-cut indication. Again, in our own SIR, um, we, have, we have recommendations that were written in 2011 that say that um, if you have closed head injury, spinal cord injury, um, severe pelvic fractures or long bone fractures, a filter may be indicated. So our own societal recommendations are contrary to some of the recommendations that others make. And that gets things. So how did we get into this mess? Well, we created the mess. And, and uh, this is going back, this is actually from uh, 2003 when we published, uh, not uh, we meaning our society, published some standards that said additional indications uh, included a number of issues without DVT. So anybody who is high risk really, we said, might be a candidate. And then when that was revised uh, in 2009, um, we still had these uh, prophylactic indications. Um, so what's actually happened in, in, for example, in the hospital I work in is that we're asked to do filters for patients with small tibial clots. Um, we're asked to put filters in uh, because what happens is, uh, is as medicine gets really busy, people want to just streamline the care, and one way to deal with a PE is not to deal with it, is to turf it to someone else and say, you guys just put a filter in, I don't have to worry about it. So about half the, we get all these requests, everybody's a fall risk in our hospital, everybody is a risk for something. I don't know what, I'm not even sure what that means to be a fall risk. I think I'm a fall risk for sure most evenings on the weekend, but I don't have a filter and I've, um, so I, I think that we've really liberalized this. So things are starting to change and, and come back around. And one of the reasons things change are starting to change is people are starting to see now that the filter usage is so high is that there's a lot of complications to filter placement that a number of, uh, that people didn't recognize. In fact, I was at an angio club in our city, um, I guess about two weeks ago, and someone um, showed a series of five SVC filters. Now, I've been working in Miami, I've been working in our practice for 24 years. We haven't put an SVC filter in, and this guy comes from a small hospital with five of them in three years. And I said to him, well, I, I don't think you're seeing different patients than we are. What, I mean, why are you doing that? And he said, well, what's the harm? There's no complications from filter placement. And I said to him, well, I don't think you've ever followed your patients then because if you follow any of these patients, we all know that cable thrombosis is a real issue. We all know that, um, um, that we can get into problems if you do this long enough. Sooner or later, something's going to migrate, st struts, uh, fracture, and we've seen all types of problems with, you know, uh, f access site thrombosis, cable penetration, and all this type of thing. So... To say that you don't see complications probably implies that you don't follow your patients. So that's led to an issue. So, so this is what the FDA says now. When you, get an, when you get a filter approved and blacked out there is the type of filter, but this is the canned statement from the FDA that it's indicated for the prevention of pulmonary embolism um, and uh, Basically, it's all about pulmonary embolism. There's no other real indication um, that's a hard, strict indication, although we do expand on that. So the question is, who should we put a filter in? Well, as we go back and see all these different guidelines, it really depends on what literature you look at. So a huge meta-analysis was done of filter placements in trauma patients, and it came out, although the strength of the evidence was low, it suggested maybe you should put that in. That was in JAMA. But um, in Michigan, a large registry in bariatric patients suggested no. We're asked to put these in bariatric patients constantly, almost daily. Um, we don't do that uh, as much as, nearly as much as we're asked, but we are asked all the time. 
that's led to a study that's going on right now in the states called the PRESERVE study, which is predicting the safety and, ef and effectiveness of, the in of inferior vena cava filters. And this isn't a study that a bunch of people said, hey, let's put together. What happened is um, some leaders from the SIR, myself included, and some leaders from SVS got together because the FDA called and said, we want to meet with you guys. And they basically said, either you put together a trial and you run this trial and you get the data, or we're going to clamp down on all filter usage throughout the United States and we're going to send warning letters to every company. So all the companies except for two have stepped up now because, and contributed money and funding to this because if they don't, uh, they're going to receive a warning letter from the FDA and no one really wants to have that. So it's a multidisciplinary study really to look at uh, issues such as when filters are removed, what the complications are, um, and to really look at some of the safety issues that may, that may come up. So that's the environment we're living in. Um, despite that, there's a lot of new developments in filters, and, and, and if you look at market predictors, vena cava interventions, venous interventions in general are predicted to grow between 60 and 200 percent over the next five years. So clearly dealing with acute and chronic venous problems uh, is a huge source of growth. In fact, just to editorialize a little bit, what I've noticed in the United States is that this is really an emerging market, and I think PE and treatment for acute PE is probably one of our next horizons. I would say probably one of the biggest markets that we can get into if we want to, in our own practice, it's an area we're looking at to grow uh, interventional volume. And when we deal with those patients, we do often use uh, retrievable filters. We may put them in just for a day or two days. Um, but what I've noticed in traveling around a bit is that this is a super hot topic for the cardiologist. They are into the venous world now as much as they got into the arterial world um, 10 or 15 years ago. So I, I really believe this is one of the new hot areas in, in interventional medicine, and I would suggest that maybe if you're looking for different practice opportunities that you develop a little venous service line in your facility, whether it's a clinic or a hospital or whatever, and look at things that you may be able to offer, whether it's for acute or chronic um, deep vein thrombosis or pulmonary embolism. Um, I think it's going to be a big deal. Retrievable filters now are put in, in the United States, about between 60 and 70 percent of all filters going in right now are retrievable filters. So we're not, um, uh, we've gotten away from permanent filters. This is a big issue with the FDA because the reality, as you guys know, is that if someone's 88 years old, and they can't be anticoagulated, and they have an extensive DVT, the filter's never coming out, right? I mean, we kind of know that. If someone has cancer and their life expectancy is two months or three months, but they don't want to die of a PE, that filter's not coming out. So the FDA has suggested we not use retrievable filters, but most of us say, well, we need to use them because um, – we have inventory issues. So in our hospital, for example, we're constantly being asked, what can we eliminate from inventory? What can we do uh, in terms of streamlining our inventory? Well, it would make sense to only have one type of filter. It can stay in forever or it can come out. So we have a lot of pressure on us from our facility to limit having four or five or even two types of filters and go with one filter. In the meantime, we have the FDA saying, if it's going to stay in, use a permanent filter. So. I don't think one's right or wrong. I know in our own hospital, though, we have a huge issue trying to look at our own inventory. When we look at a filter and we want to design a new filter or design any filter, uh, there's certain things that we want to have. And we want to know, first of all, we've got to be able to deliver this exactly, right? Because we don't want the filter moving or ending up in a spot. We don't want it. So that's very important. Um, we need it to maintain uh, position while capturing clots. So we have seen in the past some, of, some filters, when large amounts of clots entered the filter, the filters migrated. We had a case in our own hospital about five years ago, a patient who um, um, one day had a filter in place on a CT and died the next day with a massive DVT, uh, and the filter was uh, moved up into the right ventricle full of clot, and the presumption is 
it, it actually happened during a bowel movement that the patient had. That's when he experienced his symptoms. Um, and probably the filter migrated as a clot pushed it. It wasn't uh, well uh, fixed in the walls, which is something we're going to deal to. So we need stability. But the big issue is if we want to remove it, we have to be able to get it out. So one of the problems is when you have stability, the more you, the more you work on stability, the flip side of that is what happens to retrievability. If you put something in that's so well fixed, then pulling it out might take a little more force. So we have to balance those issues. When we look at our design decisions, we have to look at our anchor design. We need anchors that will hold the filter in place but still allow it to be retrieved. The filter material can be important because different metals may be more thrombogenic. And that gets into the number of struts. And if you've looked at a lot of the filter designs over the past five years and you sit in your own lab and say, what filter do I want? If you have different reps come in and line them up, some, some filters have multiple struts, different length struts. Some have minimal struts. And when you put the number of struts and the anchor design together, you kind of get this issue of, well, how well that filter will be uh, able to stay in place. So, and then the, the shape of the strut, because if you just, for example, have a straight strut and it per perforates a wall, we've seen struts go all the way through into the aorta. So we need some way to anchor that or to prevent that strut from just going all the way uh, into the next vessel, into the next neighborhood. And then the issue has, we also have some issues with design at the top of the filter because the hardest thing about retrieving a filter is if the filter's t tilted or tipped because then I think we've all been in that boat where the filter tip is against the wall. It's really, really hard to get it out. And we've had uh, particular problems uh, in the U.S. Um, with one type of filter that would sometimes go as far as 90 degrees, and that, that filter has been pulled off the market. They, it's like their fifth rendition that, of, of filters, um, and we continually have problems uh, with retrieval of certain types. So. As we look at design, the impact of design um, determines our complication rate. So if you really look at what the complications are reported in the literature, these are kind of the numbers that you might see. Um, and it depends on which filter you're using. So caval penetration can be as low as 9% and as high as essentially 90%, depending on which type of filter you use. Migration, uh, same thing, depending on which site. And that's probably the worst of all our problems. And then this issue with IVC thrombosis. And one of the reasons that in our own practice that we, um, although we put a lot of filters in, we say no to many more than we put in is because if you do fall, and I'm sure all of you do, when someone comes back with an IVC thrombosis, it's a really hard thing to manage. And if they couldn't get anticoagulation or lytic therapy to begin with, if that's why they have the filter, then you don't have a lot of options to clean that filter out. So sometimes we'll go up with mechanical devices and do things. But when someone's kind of doomed to having bilateral lower extremity edema, massively swollen legs and this type of thing for the rest of their life, whether that life expectancy is two months or 20 years, it really is a debilitating thing. So that's for us is a huge, huge issue is this cable thrombosis. And then I think the recurrent PE thing is something that we could probably talk about at some point. But... We're asked sometimes to put filters in because someone has a positive CTA, and the PE is, is in some tertiary or quaternary branch. It's really the size, like, like it's so small that, that there's no filter in the world that would stop it. You know, you'd have to interrupt the cava. So this just happened to me, actually, on, um, I was on call this weekend. It was a holiday weekend in, in the States, Memorial Day which is always a disaster when you add the third day in because that means Friday, everything's an emergency. Things start getting dumped in from everywhere. So, of course, a patient who's been in the hospital for like two weeks on Friday night, all of a sudden there's this emergency. And there's this very nice woman, uh, and I went by to see her, and they, they wanted an emergency filter. And as you guys live through this too, right? So I'm following the patient for two weeks maybe as a primary care doc. I check off to my partner who's never seen it. He says, as a PE, put a filter in. He just wants to wash his hands of the whole thing. And this, this pulmonary embolus is so small. I mean, I, I think you could have 20 of these things. It would only make you feel better. There's no way it could hurt you. And um, 
I, I couldn't imagine putting a filter in for that. She could be anticoagulated anyway. So recurrent PE, depending on how hard you look, that rate may change a lot because tiny, tiny emboli aren't going to be stopped by a filter. In fact, the more filtration you have, the less flow you have. That's why originally in the 60s, these original filters like the Moeb and Uden filters, which were umbrellas where the word came from, there was a really high rate of cable thrombosis because they trapped everything, including the flowing blood. You know, there were just a few holes around there. So, so we don't want that. So when we look at our design, I guess I'm long-winded, is you can dial in your complication rates depending on what you, how, how and what you design. So when we look at technology, let's get back and look at some of the anchor design. Originally, all the anchors were designed to retain the filters permanently. And the pro of that is that you get good filter position, but the con is you couldn't retrieve. So then hook-style anchors evolved to give or release from the IVC wall. And um, that's really where we've kind of evolved to now. So if we look at some of the evidence of different types of filters, this is a study um, that was in JVIR um, looking at 120 patients um, who returned for filter retrieval. And, and by the way, I love all the filter trials. When you look at this, you'll see like 620 patients, but only 120 with retrievable filters, only 120 came back. Another big issue is that um, many patients that should have their filter out get lost to follow-up. So we have to follow. We, so we actually have a nurse in our department who does a lot of things, um, but one of, the, one of her jobs, it's not her only job, is every filter we put in, she gets a name and she gets, uh, we keep a database and she follows that patient for us, calls the physician's offices and stays on top of them when they want the filter out. And a lot of times the hematologist will come back and say, look, it can't come out for whatever reason. But many times, yeah, yeah, we were trying to figure out how to do that. And then we get them back in. So here, 120, they all had these hook styles. Um, uh, but 86% had penetration greater than 3 millimeters. Uh, now, again, this goes back to these design issues. No fractures are rigid in this particular filter. They're rigid struts, so they're, they're stable. But there's this huge penetration issue. Um, and that can become um, a big issue when you're trying to retrieve a filter. Now, I, I'll be honest and tell you that we see this type of penetration with this filter. I haven't seen it cause many clinical symptoms, but every once in a while, and, and I was on this uh, panel with the FDA where they had this, some data that someone presented, and they, they can't attribute symptoms, but someone comes in with back pain, let's say six months after a filter's placed, and the struts are penetrated way through the cable wall. Is that back pain from those struts? I don't know. Who would know? There's no way really to tell. Everybody in the world has back pain at some point or another. Um, um, so it's very hard to know how symptomatic patients really are from that. The G2 filter um, uh, is another filter that was studied. This is a study in Pennsylvania, 174 patients, um, and over half of these had migration of more than two centimeters. So that's really alarming, right? I'd rather deal with just about anything than a filter migrating. Um, half of them had st strut, stud penetra strut penetration, and f almost uh, three and a half percent had fractures. So this is something we've dealt with a lot when we take these filters out and there's a fractured strut that you leave behind. Um, and that, again, I don't know what the significance of that is, but I do know when you tell a patient that there's a metal strut, a little piece of metal sticking into one of these veins in your abdomen and try to explain that away, it usually doesn't go too well. Um, so it's, it's certainly something that's caused that filter a lot of problems. It's been taken on and off the market, revision after revision, um, and not, not to endorse or not endorse, but we just got to the point in our practice where we felt we couldn't use that filter anymore because there were so many problems that also sometimes tilt almost 90 degrees. So um, we got very creative in removing those filters. Uh, so that's one thing, all right? So then we can look at materials, and we won't go into this too, but, but you know, basically if you look at stainless steel, it's very strong, um, but not resilient. Nitinol is resilient, but um, 
really the design matters a lot because, as you know, nitinol is conformable and 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 and, uh, and flimsy enough that if you have a bad design, it can it can um, bend in a lot of different ways. And then the conochrome filters are robust, um, but they have a high radial force, so they push into the wall. So when we look at um, evidence of performance, again, this is the Gunther Tulip filter. This is from San Francisco with 58 patients that actually came at a 200. Um, they showed that the longer the filter's in, the more likely it's going to penetrate and the deeper it's going to penetrate. So we kind of, I think, would all guess that if we were asked that. Uh, but again, if you plan on taking your filter out, with some of these filters, the quicker you get them out, the better you are. So one of our big challenges is to find filters that we can retrieve long term, not that can get out past 90 days or past 60 days. And this is one filter that clearly the longer it's in, the less likely it's going to come out. Option, um, the option filter originally came out with um, a hook that was modified um, uh, so that the hook would allow good um, good penetration into the cable wall, but not deep penetration, and would allow retrievability. Uh, we'll get into some of the issues that have come up with that. So the hook is curved, so it pre prevents migration cranially, right? If you get a little caudal migration, that's not the end of the world, um, which we see with all filters in, in different varying amounts of... But, but it's a cranial migration. Um, leg extension to prevent perforation. So this here, um, you can see that this little leg, as it extends out, when this hooks into the wall and this extends out, this prevents this hook from penetrating all the way through the wall. So it's a nice little feature that prevents deep penetration of the filter. What we see is when we look at retention and retrieval, um, the retrieval force is less, obviously, than the retention force, which is what we want. But one of the things we learned with the original option filter is that while it didn't migrate, that retrieval was a little bit difficult. And um, while it could come out, there are a lot of people who complain that it took too much force. So this has been modified, and we'll get into that a little bit. But sometimes, um, and I think we've all been in that boat where you're trying to pull a filter out, and when you kind of look down and realize every muscle in your body is flexed and you're pulling as hard as you can, that you might, um, something might be a little too tight, tightly placed. And with the, with not just with option, but with all filters we have that, but with the option, the original option, it was very hard to, um, uh, for some people, very hard, to, in some people, very hard to retrieve. Um, this is a study published from the original option um, um, publication that led to uh, approval. Um, it was led by Matt Johnson in Indiana. We, our center, I think, we we're the leading enrollers in, in this trial. Um, and it was 100 patients that were followed up for 180 days. Um, only 1% had strut penetration greater than 3 millimeters. No one fractured. And the 2% that migration was, um, was downward migration. We didn't have... I think there might have been one filter that came up more than 20 millimeters, but nothing uh, moved up uh, into the heart, which was a, obviously a very good thing. So after that got approved, a number of other studies came out, more real-world kind of thing. Um, once things are approved, the indications expand, and, and we tend to use things much more liberally. So this is 2012 with 165 patients with zero migration. Um, Again, a very low wall penetration, zero fractures, and in this study, 100% ret retrieval success. So, which is obviously, that's getting close to what we want in perfection. Now, I'm not going to tell you it's perfect because in our own experience, this and every other filter, when I put them in, I can't get them all out. Um, so I wouldn't, I don't think I've had 100% on anything, including tests I've taken my entire life. So... I, when I was younger, I wish I could have gotten 100 on a few things, but I was more like in that 75 range. So <laughs> anyway, back to real world. So 2010 to 2012, as, as you, know, you can see between these two studies in the first 100 and then two years later, really good data when you look at it. And, and the big thing is that IVC occlusion 
um, was really minimal in the study of 165 patients. Um, and it was 3% in the original trial, which was right in line with what other filters report. So certainly not a particular problem. Um, so when we look at the retrievable force, which is what I was telling you, we have great retention force, great fracture rates, great migration rates, low penetration rates. But the retrieval force um, is thought to be an opportunity for improvement. So what happens with that? Um, then the option elite got introduced, and this is a little bit different. It's, if you actually held it in your hand and looked at it, you might think it's an identical filter, but um, if you put your glasses on and, and spent a couple seconds, you'd realize that it's, it's actually different in a lot of ways. So it has a better anchoring system, um, uh, and we'll talk about that, and it does help with easier retrieval. Um, so on the old option, we showed you that, um, so you, you see these kind of hooks here, in the new option, um, you're going to see that um, there's an, in well, let me back up here. You'll see the hooks are a little bit different. Um, there's a change in the angle here, and we'll get into that in a little bit, but that's going to help in retrievability in removing this filter just by changing that angle. And also, um, you'll see that uh, the, the struts are designed a little bit differently. So. On the original option, there were three large anchors and three standard anchors. On the option elite, all the anchors are these standard anchors, and the larger anchors that you see here have disappeared, so they all look like this. So that, I think, allows the filter to come out easy, but doesn't give up um, the ease of uh, placing it or the uh, safety value you have from preventing um, migration. So they also changed the snare zone, which is a very subtle thing, but it, it, um, it's got a little deeper well and a little longer well, so your snare catches on it. Sometimes in the old one, uh, this, this zone was a little smaller, and you had to, it may take a little more. You could always get your snare around the thing, but it may not hook in this little well. And now with the deeper well, it's much easier to do. So we found a, a good bit of improvement there. Now, We'll talk a little bit about the filter, but the filter goes in through a six French sheath, so it's a very low profile thing. Pulling it out, we still use a nine or 10 French sheath, um, but it's much easier to snare now. One of the reasons we like this in our own practice, and I'll get to this now, but is we often leave a central line in if patients, someone's really sick, like with bad PE, and they want to monitor the patient. And putting in a line through that six French puncture is a lot e there's, you know, especially if it's a lower profile line, there's no leakage or, or oozing around it. So we do that a lot. Um, we like this, especially if we're going to lyse a patient and we put a filter in first and, and sometimes we'll do that when there's clot up in the cava. Um, we will, we get much less oozing from the neck. All, I would tell you also in our practice, not 100%, but I think 99%, without exaggeration, of all our filters go in the right jugular vein. If they don't make it in the right jugular vein, they go in the left jugular vein. And only if we can't get something in from the upper extremity do we go to the leg. Now, that's our practice preference. It certainly doesn't mean we're right or wrong. It just, it's just the way we end up doing things. So we end up using the neck more commonly. We can discuss that if anyone wants to and why we do it. Um, but if we compare the option and the option elite here, what you see at the end of the day is the retention force um, remains identical, but the um, re removal force has dropped um, a good bit, about a third less. So now that force that it takes to remove the filter has been much simplified, uh, but we didn't give anything up, we meaning them, not, not particularly me, but um, they didn't give anything up in their design um, uh, in terms of stability, uh, but they did make it easier to get out, and this, this chart shows that um, very nicely. 63, this is a study, uh, again, in the U.S., 63 elite, uh, option elite filters were placed at six sites over a basically um, an eight-month period, and just like all the other percentages I was showing you when there were five and 600, a small percent of these come out, so eight out of eight were uh, easily retrieved, and in the physician.
efficient questionnaires, the retrieval force was thought to be significant, you know, much easier, less force. And again, no migration, perforation, fractures, or cable, cable occlusions were reported. Um, so to date, there's been over 15,000 of these implanted. Um, and back to the company, about 50 total reported complaints. So some of people in this room who I spoke to earlier have had a couple, have put some of these in, and I'd like to hear their experience. One thing we know is that that's a very low complaint um, report, but I guess, and I know at the sake, I know industry's in the room, but we know that not everyone who has a problem complains to industry. So we know that that number might be a little bit more. We see that a lot. Um, when I work on some FDA panels, you'll see these things where um, the complaint rate for a certain device is like three or four percent, and when you send surveys out, it could be tenfold that or whatever. And, um, so, but, but overall, um, that's a pretty good, and 15,000 to have a very low complaint rate like that uh, is good, especially because it were the force to take these out um, is significantly reduced. So what about some filter techniques in terms of taking things out? And if anyone has any comments, you can chime in at any point. Otherwise, again, we'll save this. Yeah, yeah. So that's the thing. You know, we don't, um, I, in my own experience, we haven't found it to be a big deal. What makes it a big deal is that so many people are imaged constantly. So, you know, I put a filter in you. You come in and I, for whatever reason, you get a CT in my facility. My partner reads it and goes, oh, what's this? He's not an interventionalist. And I tell him, oh, that's, that happens. But the bigger problem is when you go to the next facility and get a CT and someone says, oh, my God, you have all this metal that's poking in your cava. And so although we don't see it as a clinical, uh, patients don't come in and say, you know, I have radicular pain and there's a strut in some nerve or something like that. What we do see are patients coming back with, you know, uh, extremely upset, worried because they've been told that they have a foreign body that's poked through their cava. We get internists, hematologists, referring physicians that panic at the report, at the description of the report. So a lot of what we do in those patients isn't really dealing with clinical symptoms, but it's managing all the physicians involved and the patient and trying to talk them off the ledge of um, that there's a disaster going on when there, when there may not be. The, well, I think what we do see, so, and, and again, not to, um, I use the option, but we also, in, because we have a teaching facility, I'll, I'll disclose to you that we have used every approved filter and, and in our own inventory, even though they're forcing us to limit it down. We stock, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four different filters. So we try, so I want to be fair, but with the um, selects, with the, the cooks, um, I'm sorry, with the tulips, they penetrate enough. They are very, we do see after about three months, which that study showed, they are hard to get out. So when we see that penetration, and with the old uh, barred filters with those G2s, when those things came way out the wall, sometimes you'd pull and pull, and then those strut, those are the ones that broke. Um, and that's why we stopped using them. We'd, we um, would see them break, and um, there's a... <laughs> There's a practice that's about 30 miles away from us, and uh, um, I say this kind of smiling because the guy who's <laughs> the interventional guy who uh, is in that practice is one of our old fellows, so we trained him, so he's like part of our family. But um, he had he was putting lots of these G2s in, and they were tilting and migrating and breaking, and he kept sending them to me to retrieve, and and I kept. So one day I called, like these patients would come in from the office. I had a filter placed up in plantation, blah, 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 which is about 30 miles away. And i here to see you about retrieving it. And I called our old fellow and I said, how come, uh, why are you sending these to me? They're all a disaster. The patients are like completely distraught. They, have, they see their own x-rays. You don't have to be a genius to know that something really should be that, you know, like it just doesn't look right. And he said basically because... Um, 
because you have a reputation, it's much harder to sue you than it would be me, because it would be harder to get people to testify against you. So that's, I mean, so so we were seeing these things. They were so. My point is, we we were taking out tons of filters that we didn't put in from places where people would send them in, and we would see the ones that penetrated the wall were, were harder to get out. So it does have some clinical impact. Okay, so when I okay, so that's a great question. So uh, I don't know if everyone heard. So earlier I said there's lots of filters we can't get out. So when is that quitting point? So first of all, what do we mean by lots? So in, in our own practice, truthfully, we, as I told you, we follow our patients closely, and um, Northwestern did a similar study, but we take out about 60 percent of the filters we put in, which is 40 percent more in the U.S. than the average group does. The average group of uh, interventionalists at one facility retrieve maybe about 20 percent of their filters. So we do get out the majority of filters, but we don't. So the reasons we can't take them out will include the following, and I'll show some cases. You go to do a vena cavagram and there's a lot of clot in the filter. That's, I mean, I think we all agree the filter did its job, whatever you want. Um, when we contract, the, the things that make it harder when the Apex of the filter is embedded in the wall, and we have a bunch of techniques that we'll talk about, and maybe you guys could teach me something or things that you've done. Um, so if you can't get your snare on the filter, um, and then the other thing is sometimes you get your snare and the legs are so endothelialized that you pull hard, and you just get to a point where you're pulling, um, and, and to be honest, it kind of becomes subjective. You know what I mean? Like if if you would consider it like your anaerobic workout for the day, that's probably too hard to be pulling. Um, if it's, you know, so, so like it, it's, it's, it becomes subjective. Now, people at Stanford and some other places have gotten into this laser removal um, where they take uh, vascular lasers and they go in and they can uh, burn off the endothelial lining and then remove the filters that way. We haven't been doing that. At that point... You know, to be fair about this whole thing, while we know that cable thrombosis is an issue and we know all these things, the simple truth is a lot of fil the majority of filters don't cause anyone a problem. And, and other than the fear that some people have, I think it's sometimes safer just to leave the filter than to risk hurting it. So, you know, we've been in these patients where we're in from above and below trying to do different maneuvers. And you're pulling real hard, and if you shoot a cavagram, um, which we've done, it, it's you can you take that cava. I mean, it's completely occluded te when you're pulling. I mean, you have it stretched out and it's deformed, and you kind of really wonder like, was the patient just better off keeping the filter? Which millions and millions of people did until five years ago or seven years ago when we started with all the retrievable filters. So it isn't the worst thing to keep a filter. I think the issue is is that. Many patients are now aware that their filters can come out. And people who get filters in the United States, 50% or more, that don't have a DVT or a PE, when they're out of that high-risk zone, so let's say they had their bariatric surgery, it's one thing to say, hey, you got to live with your filter, but you had a massive PE, and this saved your life. And you could say, okay, I get it. And if something happens, you know, I had this clot. But if you never had a clot and it was just a prophylactic thing, those patients really want the filter out. And the other thing that helps those patients really want their filter out are the billboards along the interstate in Miami and other places that say, if you have an IVC filter, call this number. Because that's <laughs> happening now. We have those in Miami. Uh, when I drive up to Fort Lauderdale uh, with my kids, so I grew up in Fort Lauderdale and work in Miami, and, and we go up to visit um, my parents, the kids' grandparents, whatever. And one of my, my son says to me, it was like a few years ago, he goes, Dad, do you put those in? He points to the to side, I go, yeah, that's it. And he goes, well, have you, you know, and because the lawyers are all over this issue of, of that the FDA is on now. So I think the people, the billboard, uh, the marketing for the lawyers has gotten a lot of people worked up about getting their filter out. So whether it needs to come out or not, I don't know, but it's certainly become a huge issue. So, anyway, uh, other questions? Yes? Yeah, we do try it anyway, and you can get some of them out. In fact, you can get a lot of them out, but those are the ones you have to be careful about breaking. 
Um, those are the ones we don't want to break. Um, so, but you can still try it. So, you know what, I'm going to go a little bit quicker here because I didn't realize we started a little bit later and I have a few other things. Um, I want to get into this filter tilt thing. And when you pull these filters out that are embedded in the wall, this is what they look like. A lot of times you get this, you'll pull out the endothelial line and that's not all fresh clot that's on there. That's from pulling really hard. And you can see this is a filter that's embedded in the wall here. One of the other, there are other filters that don't have hooks at all that just rely on radial force. But the problem with this particular filter, which we put in hundreds of at one point until we realized it, is that it kind of directs, um, it, it, it changes the way blood flows in the, in the cava. And so it self positions, it doesn't tilt. Um, but caval thrombosis with this filter is very high. And we saw this probably 10 to 1 compared to all our other filters. When these filters go in, the rate of caval thrombosis is extremely high. So we stopped using those altogether. Even though they self-center and they can be retrieved, um, we, we abandoned this completely in our practice. And this is that endothelialization that we talked about. It can get pretty thick, so sometimes people use lasers to get that off. So if you really look at this, um, there are different ways to push that filter, that off the wall. In the bottom right, this is something we'll do a lot, is we'll try to wedge a wire around the filter in the wall and put a balloon up and blow the balloon up to push the filter off the wall so we can get hooks around the neck. Um, other things we do is we use snares, not at the hook site, but we'll use a tip deflecting wire or we'll take a Benson and put it through the struts down here and then snare it on the other side and yank on it a little bit to pull that off the wall, and then either from a separate site or if we get it off the wall and it stays, then we can come in and grab the neck here. And we do that. That's probably our first line thing. And then this is another thing that we can do. And then this other idea, um, that I'll show you what we've done a few times also, is we put a sheath up from below and wedge it right in the apex, and then we can use either a tip deflecting wire or a regular wire to help push and get it off the wall. And this just shows um, sometimes if you get a set, if you use a coaxial sheet, so you have like a 10 French sheath um, with, a sh with, a di with a guide catheter inside it, rather than getting the 10 French, it's sometimes hard to get the 10 French sheath down, but if you get the first guide catheter on the hook, then it's easy to get the bigger catheter over it, and we do that. This goes back to the trapeze thing, and we know that there's higher thrombosis rates. So um, we talked about the upper and lower tier struts, which people thought would be a great design, but that filter um, had lots of penetration, lots of fracture issues, lots of endothelial problems, and lots of tilt problems. So um, uh, this goes back to the tulip filter we were talking about with this high rate of uh, um, perforation through the walls. With the optional lead, again, six struts with curved anchors. Um, you can place this over a guide wire, which I think is a huge advantage. Now, there's some people in this room who have placed these over guide wires and had some tilt. But I would suggest to you, if you're doing it from the neck in particular, on the left side, if you've ever tried to place filters from the left neck, you can uh, pierce your sheath, you can get the filters wedged. When you go over a wire, it makes it really, really easy. Um, and the idea of going over a wire is that you have a self-centering um, rail down the middle. Now, I know that, again, to mention, just to be fair, there's a few people have said that over a wire they've had these tilt, and I think that'll have to bear itself out over time. We've had very good luck, and one of the things we like about this filter is that it doesn't tilt as much. One thing I do think with all filters, and this one in particular, is if you, you have to keep back tension on your sheath. If you happen to be pushing in a little bit, either with your wire or with the old device, with a pusher, if you have a little too much push and not enough tension back, you'll tilt any filter. You'll just flip it over no matter what. So um, it's every new filter, you have to make sure you have back, anytime you're putting a filter in, that you have all the tension reduced and you're pulling back on it so that the thing has a chance, so the filter itself has a chance to stand straight up. Yep, yep, please. No, we started this years ago um, because 
many of the patients have DVT, and we felt that if we punctured the groin, we could prop, you know, we could create more DVT. Now that we're down, to, that, that was when we were using 12 French filters and things. Now down to six French, um, it's probably easier, but we, in our own practice, again, we don't stop anticoagulation or anything when we do most venous work. And although the neck, you could get tracheal compression and all this type of thing, it's so easy to access the neck and it's so unlikely to get hematomas that we find the access to be easier. And then the easiest way to stop bleeding, of course, is to sit someone up because you decompress the vein so we can really control. And it's a very sterile environment. So rather than keep someone flat, we can get them sitting up. And we, so we just got into the habit of doing these from the neck. And that's how we that's how we do. I, not saying it's right, just a practice preference. I would honestly tell you, I think that the great thing is you can go either way. One nice thing I'll mention about the sheet, since we're getting towards the end, is that the dilator has two side holes in it, so you don't have to open up. If you want to do a run, you can do it right through the dilator. There's markers on it. You can measure your caver if you're worried about sign size, and the pusher. Um, is curved so that you can kind of angular as you're pulling back. You can, you can if you wish, uh, manipulate the filter a little bit. One filter goes for jugular and femoral. All you do is flip the device around. The good news is, there's an arrow and it's printed on there, so it's a little hard to mess up, which is um, just up my alley. We know that this works well. Um, uh, Ninety-eight percent retrieval to success. Um, uh, uh, which I think is really good. And in these studies, the tilt was very minimal. So we know that in real life, we've, the other people have seen more tilt. But um, we do think there's a new technology um, that makes retrieval easier. Um, the fact that you can deliver it over the wire may help you when you're coming from the left groin or the left neck. Um, and I think the data that I presented supports it, uh, the value of this filter as a, uh, with an excellent safety uh, track record and um, uh, should be part of our armamentarium. There's a patient where we wouldn't take the filter out, right? There's a ton of clot in the cava still, and we don't want to do that. Um, this is how we'll snare that kind of on the bench. We can use a tip deflecting wire when the tip's in the wall. We can go through and either pull that off or snare the other end of the wire and pull and pull it off the wall. Uh, and that's what, we'll try, that's what we'll try to do in these cases. Sometimes we'll, in different types of filters, we'll try to get a snare around the bottom part and the top part and yank the whole thing off and then pull it up into the sheath, as you see here. Um, this is an idea that we use. This, we, I've done this a number of times where we can put a guide cath from below, put it right up into the apex, pass a wire up, and it can help push that uh, off the wall, and, if you, and with the option, if you can get a wire, because it's over the wire, you can grab the wire on the top end and really pull the hook off the wall, and it makes retrieval easier. If you snare the top end, then you can run your big sheath right down on top of it, and you can get the filter out pretty easily. So that's one very nice uh, trick or modification we can use. And that's what's happening here. You can see the guide catheter on the bottom, the wire snared, and then we'll just bring the big sheet down, grab the filter, and we can get it out. This type of filter is going to be very hard to get out no matter what we do. It's, it's tilted quite a bit. Now, that looks like, when you look at that, it looks like the, head, the, the apex is actually out of the cava. What we find a lot on CTs is it's just tenting the cava. It may not be out, but to get, when you have that much tilt, it can be really, really hard to remove a filter. So those are the ones you kind of wonder, are they just better off being left there? We have pulled these out. It's a tremendous amount of work from above and below, um, but not all of them can come out. And then, of course, this is the, the gentleman who told me, here's one of these op, this is one of these uh, trapeze in the right ventricle, and here's one that came up from below um, and kind of gets stuck in the main pulmonary artery. Um, pulling these out of the heart, you can snare that easily, but you have to, and I know that this has happened. I know of one case where this caught on the tricuspid valve, ripped the tricuspid valve, patient expired, probably would have been better off being left there, but who wants to leave that there when you see that type of thing? So 
Um, in summary, I think we have a really good new filter design. Um, it helps us a lot in terms of our retrievability. There are a lot of issues with filters. Any questions I can answer? Yes. So the original option was harder, and I think part of it had to do with the grip. I don't think the alloy was much of a problem because it was easy to snare, and you could get a sheath over three-quarters of the filter. It was just getting the legs to relieve. Now that all the anchors are the shorter anchors, those legs release a lot easier. So I think it was more the grip than anything else. Okay. But thank you very much. I appreciate that.